Pastor Javen will continue with week two of our summer reading series today, where we'll look at how change starts within. So take a moment now and prepare your heart for today's service. Pastor Javen's going to come up and bring the word. So if y'all would turn to Genesis chapter 39, um, this is kind of the start of today's message. We're going to start in verse one of Genesis chapter 39, talking about Joseph. It says in Genesis chapter 39, verse one, it says, now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt. Potiphar, an Egyptian who was one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard brought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him there. The Lord was with Joseph so that he prospered and he lived in the house of the Egyptian master. When his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord gave him success in everything that he did, Joseph found favor in the eyes, in his eyes and became his attendant. Potiphar put him in charge of his household and he entrusted in in his care everything he owned. From the time he put him in charge of the household and all all that he owned, the Lord blessed the household of the Egyptian because of Joseph. The blessing of the Lord was on everything Potiphar had, both in the house and in the field. So Potiphar left everything he had in Joseph's care. With Joseph in charge, he did not concern himself with anything except the food he ate. Now Joseph was well-built and handsome. And after a while, his master's wife took notice of Joseph and said, come to bed with me. But Joseph refused. With me in charge, he told her, my master does not concern himself with anything in the house. Everything he owns, he has entrusted to my care. No one is greater in this house than I am. My master has withheld nothing from me except you because you are his wife. And then, how then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? And though she spoke to Joseph day after day, he refused to go to bed with her or even be with her. One day he went into the house to attend to his duties and none of the household servants were inside. She caught him by his cloak and said, come to bed with me. But he left his cloak in her hand and ran out of the house. Amen. We started a series last week that we are calling Summer Reading. And we are following through or taking our launching point from this book that was written by a pastor uh, by the name of Kevin Myers. He's a pastor of a church in Atlanta, Georgia, Georgia, a 12 stone church. And this, the book is called Home Run. And it is uh, basically just a path. He gives you a path for discipleship. And he lays out a path for discipleship in your life and a path that you can use to disciple and help grow others. And he basically uses baseball, specifically the baseball path, as a parable to show this path and to teach this path. And last week we used where he talked about home plate as our launching point. And he says that at home plate, what happens at home plate is this is the place where you connect with God. This is the place where you find purpose and you find power in him and through his Holy Spirit. It's that place where you win dependence on God. And so we launched from there and talked more about what it looks like to be dependent on our Heavenly Father, to be dependent on his son, Jesus Christ, and what he's done for us in our life. To, as Jesus said, to abide in him, to remain in him, to make ourselves at home in his love. We're going to move with Myers across the base path this week, and we're going to go to first base. And Myers calls this the personal base. This is where you develop your character. It's where you learn to win within. Now, a lot of times we, there's a lot of things that we face in our life, a lot of things that we go through. And we often think of our battles as primarily being around us. But the greatest battles that we often face aren't around us, they're within us. They're inside of us. You know, pointed out that Myers used, he, he went, through, went back to Joseph's life, Genesis chapter 37 through 50. If you've never read the story of Joseph, I encourage you to go, to go look at that and study that. Even if you have, to restudy it because it's, it's a wonderful picture of what God can do in our life. And he pointed out how these principles, these patterns are displayed all throughout Joseph's life. And really not just through Joseph's life, they're all throughout scripture. We see them through scripture. And as we go into the passages we go into, I want us to see how we see these patterns even at play all throughout the word. But he uses Joseph's life and he points to Joseph's life. That's why Pastor Caleb read the passage that he read this morning. This was that place that Joseph really 
where we see, I'm sure there's other places in his life, but this is one that we see where Joseph had to fight and battle and win a war within him. He was at a position where many of us have probably faced in our life. We're faced with this situation. Okay, do I depend on God and honor the values and the convictions that have been built in my life because of my connection to him? Or do I seize this moment and indulge in a desire that's being enticed in the wrong way? And see, Joseph stands his ground, but well, quite literally, he runs. <laughs> I mean, talk about a great example of what you should do in any situation like that. Just run. Get out of Dodge, right? So he runs, but we see that Potiphar's wife grabs his cloak and he's running in his outer garment. Yet again, we talked about that a little bit last week, is stripped off of him and taken away from him. But here's what I want us to understand this morning. Before God can work through you in his power, his power needs to work in you. Before you can bring change, We need to go through change and we need to let God change us. John Maxwell says this about character. He says, the development of character is at the heart of our development, not just as leaders. And he says that because he primarily speaks in leadership and in regards to leaders and and being a better leader. But he says, this isn't just a leadership issue. It's as human beings. This is a human issue. He says, unaddressed cracks. And that's very important. The unaddressed part, unaddressed cracks in character only get deeper and more destructive with time. And some of us can attest that's true. You know, I like the illustration that Myers uses in his book. Uh, he, he uses this illustration of Tony Stark in the first Iron Man movie. Now, if you're not a Marvel fan, that's fine. If you've never seen those movies, that's okay. You've never seen Iron Man. Uh, I'm not endorsing those, but I do think it's a great visual. I'll explain to you what he's talking about, what he, what, what's happening. Basically, Tony Stark, if you ever even read the comics, he's like his dad, Howard Stark, who's a brilliant individual, creates things, scientist. Well, he had create, created weaponry. And he had traveled overseas to a war zone area and he was demonstrating for the military the weapons that he had created and what they can do and how powerful they are. Well, he gets into a convoy. He's leaving the scene where he had done his demonstration. And as he's leaving, all of a sudden their convoy comes under attack. As this is happening, he gets out of his Jeep. He runs to hide, finds somewhere to hide. And while he's hiding, he looks over and he sees this missile on the ground. And he realizes this missile is about to explode and he gets up again to try to run to take cover from the explosion that's about to happen. But before he runs away, he notices written on the side of that missile, Stark Industries. It's the very own bomb that he had created. And I love this visual because Myers makes this point. He says, what often blows up in our lives usually has our name written all over it. Because we most often create the problems that we have. Because what, what we say, oh, it's not going to be any big deal. It's okay. I'll, do just, I'll, I'll indulge this one time. It's going to be all right. But what's no big deal becomes a big deal. Because it grows into a pattern, a slow pattern, that eventually becomes a season in our life. And before we know it, before we realize it, it's a lifestyle that we're living. In the beginning of the year, in our on-campus discipleship study, we did a five-week study called Guardrails. Our on-campus discipleship, that'll be, just as a quick note, that'll be starting back up September 11th. One of the studies, September 11th, one on September 18th. I also encourage you, uh, you're always, we would love for you to start your own home group. I mean, you can do this with you and two other people, one couple, another couple. It doesn't have to start big. We'll have an information meeting about, To help you get those started, if you've ever wanted to start your own small group, August 22nd, that'll be going on. Those are just a couple of plugs to throw in there. But we did this study on guardrails. And we went through and we talked about these things that as we grow more dependent on God, we begin to learn the guardrails and the things that we need to put in our our life that will help keep us from having a disastrous wreck in our life. 
And the more we connect with God, the more we depend on him, the more we see those and the more we allow God to help grow in us and build us into who we need to be. Because as we're growing in him and as we're winning these battles within, we realize that it's more than just talking about being a follower of Christ. It's actually living as a follower of Christ. And we're, we can be really good at talking as a follower of Christ, but even as we talk as a follower of Christ, we often live like the culture. But if we're a follower of Christ, there has to be something different about us. There has to be something different about who we are and what God's doing in our life. We referenced Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 2 last week. I want to show you that again. I want to show it to you from the message translation this week. It says this, so here's what I want you to do, God, God helping you. Take your everyday, ordinary life, you're sleeping, you're eating, you're going to work and walking around life and place it before God as an offering. In other words, you're saying, God, I'm giving you every aspect of my life. I'm not just giving you a piece of the pie. I'm pouring every aspect of my life into you. And he said, I'm embracing what God does for me is the best thing you can do for him. Don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. In verse two, did we have that? You'll be changed from the inside out. Readily recognize what he wants from you and quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down to its level of immaturity. God brings the best out of you and develops well-formed maturity in you. But where does it say it starts? It starts within. It changes you from the inside out. Other translations, they use the term, don't be conformed to the world, but be transformed. By the renewing of your mind, that word transformed is the word metamorphuo in the Greek. It's where we get the word metamorphosis, where change takes place. It's what happens in the life of a caterpillar when they sew themselves up in that cocoon and all of a sudden they come out as this beautiful butterfly. I'm not a caterpillar expert. I do have Google. So I'll give you Javen's dumbed down rendition of the Google version of what happens in a caterpillar life. Now, if you're an expert, you know, don't get mad at me, but, but basically this is what's happening. They sew themselves up in this thing. And while they're in there, they release these enzymes and enzymes. Again, Javen's dumbed down version of this is they're proteins that act as catalysts for change is basically what's happening, which is a really cool thing. So these enzymes are released, and this is what happens. The enzymes dissolve the caterpillar of itself, of everything that needs to be dissolved, to produce in it the structure that needs to be produced so it can fly with wings. This is what God wants to do for you through his gospel. In your transformation, God re, re, uh, produces these gospel enzymes through the gospel, through growing more and more in what Christ has done for you in your life, through his death and his resurrection, the good news of the gospel, the more you dwell on that, the more he produces in you catalysts for change. And the more he creates in you that ability to, as the prophet Isaiah said, to mount up with wings as eagles. See, religious change, religious change is mechanical. Religious change can get you to conform your behaviors to adjust kind of the things that you do to focus so much on that. But you go back to the caterpillar and you think about a caterpillar and imagine a caterpillar walking around with all of its little legs trying to flap all those little legs. It's just going to get really tired really quick and go nowhere. But when it comes to religious change, that's what's happening in our life when we're focusing just on what do I need to do? What do I need to do? What do I need to do? We're flapping our wings and getting really tired. Jana even mentioned this in her prayer this morning. We're so focused on sinning, guess what? Or, or not sinning, guess what? We can't help but sin. Our desires as people are corrupt. Our human nature and those desires are corrupt. We are primarily a self-centered people. We are not God-centered and other-centered the way he wants us to be. And so any change, any lasting change that happens in our life 
has to be a change that starts at the desire level. So that we begin not to just do the right things, but to love the right things. Go with me to 2 Peter chapter 1. And as we read this passage of scripture, I'll point out, I want you to notice again, these these patterns being played out as in, in Peter's teaching. Second Peter chapter one, we'll start at verse three. He says, by his divine power, God has given us everything we need for living a godly life. We've received all this by coming to what? To know him. By connecting to him by being dependent on him. The one who called us to himself by means of his marvelous glory and excellence. And because of his glory and excellence, he's given us these great and precious promises. And these are the promises that enable you to share his divine nature and escape the world's corruption caused by human desires. So basically what Peter is saying, the more you connect the more you depend on God, the more you realize how good he is and the more he begins to change you and change your desires. And then he says, so in view of all this, make every effort to respond to God's promises and supplement your faith with a general provision of moral excellence and moral excellence with knowledge and knowledge with self-control and self-control with patient endurance and patient endurance with godliness Basically, what he's saying is what you're doing right here is as you're growing in him, you're learning to win within and become a person that God wants you to be and God has created you to be. And then he says, and go from godliness with brotherly affection and with brotherly affection, a love for everyone. We'll get more into that next week. And the more you grow like this, watch what happens. The more productive and useful you'll be in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, you'll truly begin to live a successful life. You'll truly begin to live a life with true significance, eternal significance. But those who fail to develop in this way are short-sighted or blind, forgetting that they've been cleansed from their old sins. So dear brothers and sisters, work hard to prove that you really are among those God has called and chosen. Do these things and you'll never fall away. And then God will give you a grand entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Peter goes on to say after this, he's saying, look, what Jesus did when he was on this earth, his death, his resurrection, everything he did, it gives us the confidence to grow in the way that we do. And Peter says, it's not a fairy tale, guys. It's not a made up story. It's real because Peter saw it with his own eyes. And he said it fortifies every word of the prophets who spoke to a Messiah like that who would come. See, what Peter is saying is that the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, the more you dive in to his love for you, it brings transformation. The gospel changes you in a way that nothing else can change you. It gives you life within. And the gospel, the more you dive into him, it changes your desires. That's why Paul said in his letter to the Ephesians, oh, that I hope that you would grow and learn to know more about the height and the depth and the width and the length of the love of Jesus Christ. In other words, the more I wish that you would explore how much Jesus loved you. Because as you do, you will be, you'll begin to grow exceedingly, abundantly, above and beyond all that you can imagine. The more you grow in him, the more you focus on him. It's not a list of things that I should be doing for God that changes me. It's when I stand in awe of all that God has done for me that I begin to be changed. We go back to Romans 12. We see we put ourselves on the altar. We make the sacrifices that we need to make, and that's our true form of worship before God. It's like we said last week, the only way to really overcome sin is for what your heart 
most wants and most worships and most longs for and most desires to change. Your heart's longing and desire and worship should be completely and utterly on Jesus Christ and him. This English author and theologian from the 1600s, his name is John Owen, he said this. He said, spiritual disciplines can trim the fruits of sin, but only the gospel pulls it up from its roots. In other words, what he's saying is this. We can do spiritual disciplines, which are great. We need to have spiritual disciplines in our life. But why are we doing the spiritual disciplines? If we're doing the spiritual disciplines simply to say, I've checked something off my to-do list, and out of a form of religiosity, then those spiritual disciplines are just gonna, they're just gonna trim the fruit of sin in our life. But if we do them out of response to what God has done for us, because we love him, because we want to grow in him, because we want to know more and more about his love, the more we do those things because the more we love him and the more we learn about his love, the more we are digging out and rooting out what needs to be rooted out and replanting and resoling ourselves where it needs to be. Look at Colossians chapter 1, 6, and Paul's describing what the gospel does. He says, the same good news, the gospel, that came to you is going out all over the world. And look what it's doing. It's bearing fruit everywhere. How is it doing it? By changing lives. Just as it changed your lives from the day you first heard and understood the truth about God's wonderful grace. See, church health, it's not just about people gathering and listening, which is awesome. It's about believers becoming followers and growing in him and allowing change to happen in our life. Church health is more than just about numeric growth. As much as I love this house being full on a Sunday morning, as much as I want this house to be full multiple times on Sunday morning, I pray that happens. We pray that happens. But it's more than just numerical growth. It's spiritual growth. Because if we aren't growing and allowing the gospel to transform us, how can we expect God to use us to transform the world around us? We have got to grow in him. You go back to what Jesus said in John chapter 15. We looked at it last week. The gospel bears fruit, Paul said. Because look at what Jesus said. I'm the true grapevine. Again, this translation used grapevine because that's the type of vine that most of the time was used. He says, my father is the gardener. He said, he cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit. And he prunes the branches that do bear fruit. So they will produce even more. You've already been pruned and purified by the message I've given you. Remain in me and I'll remain in you for a branch cannot produce fruit if it's severed from the vine and you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. See, Jesus is teaching. When we hear the gospel of Jesus, Paul referenced this because Jesus said it. Just hearing it catches our attention but then becoming completely dependent on him and growing in him and having that constant connection to him and what he's doing in our life, it allows us to turn away from ourselves and the desires that are within us and grow in him. And he uses the metaphor of a gardener. You know, for plants to to truly flourish, they've got to be pruned. They have to have the dead things picked away from them so that life can be produced. If, if you were here in early March, maybe you remember our shrubbery had been trimmed down and cut down all the way. And to look at it, it looked like they had been destroyed. There was nothing but death there. But the whole reason it was done was so that new life can be formed. And new life can develop and it can begin to flourish again in a new way. See, the gardener takes out from our lives those things that would be a loss to keep, but a gain to lose. 
That's why we have to be dependent and connected on God. Meyer says it this way in his book. He says, if I don't remain in the vine, I'll drift into vice. We have to remain connected to him because the more we remain connected to him, the more we grow in him. Thinking about fruit and flourishing. I want to go to one more passage of scripture this morning. It's in Galatians chapter 5. If you have your Bibles, you can flip back there to this letter that Paul wrote to the church in Galatia. It starts in verse 16. And again, we see this pattern playing out that we're talking about. Paul says, so I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Connect yourselves to God in his presence. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves because he'll begin to help you in within. The sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the spirit wants. And the spirit gives us desires that are opposite of what the sinful nature desires. These two forces are constantly fighting each other. Again, the battles we face, the biggest war we face is going on inside of us. Because Paul, what Paul's saying, this war is going on constantly. Our flesh battling against what the Spirit wants to do in our life. He says, so you're not free to carry on your, I love this, your good intentions. <laughs> good intentions often get us nowhere. I've got every intention to live my life holy and pleasing before God, but good intentions aren't good enough. I can't just have an intention to do that. I have to have a purpose and a will. Like Peter said, work every day at growing in my faith and in my knowledge of his love. But when you're directed by the spirit, you're not under obligation to the law of Moses. Listen to this. He says, when you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outburst of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, other sins like this. Let me tell you again, as I have before, anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. You cannot get more plain than that. And then he says, but when you're connected to God, when you depend on him, you allow his presence to work in you and work through you. You grow in the Holy Spirit and allow him to work in your life. Then the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. And watch what he says. Against these things, there is no law. He said, those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to the cross and they've crucified them there. And since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. Let us not become conceited and provoke one another now we're going into how we work with each other or be jealous of one another. Now, in respect to John 15 and the gardening imagery, let's think of Galatians 5 as two different plants, all right? And visuals are always fun, so I brought a visual with me. Give me a second to go give my first visual. Do, 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 do. Hey, guys, how are y'all doing this morning? It's good to see y'all. All right. They're watching on the screen back there. All right. So I don't know why we still have this plan. It was under the porch. But anyway, <laughs> my wife's not in here today. That's good. She's not visually embarrassed. All right, so first plant. There's a soil there. It's black, you know, just like dark, just like most soil looks. And Paul is saying, you, you can, you've got this soil and it looks like it's going to be good soil. But basically what happens is when you root yourself in that soil and you allow that soil of sexual immorality, debauchery, greed, dissensions, rage, all that stuff that feels good in moments, 
when you allow that stuff to be attractive and you root yourself in that, what you produce in your life does not look very pretty. It does not look like something that would attract anyone else to to want to be a part of your life or to want to have you in their life. It's not very nice. But he says there's another soil that you can root yourself in and plant yourself in. And when you do that, you live a life that's much greener. You live a life that has a lot more life to it. And yeah, there's times where there might be some things in there that, you know, they've got to be pruned a little bit and you got to take those, those dead limbs out. But more often than not, as you root yourself in the soil of God and his Holy Spirit, what he begins to produce in you is a life that's more full. It's a, it's a life that's truly living. He says, it's, it's love that you begin to produce, that the fruit begins to produce in you. It's a love that, the Greek word is agape. It's unconditional love. In other words, you start to love other people, not just because of what they can do for you. You love them because you realize they're God's creation. And whether or not they, they're loving, <laughs> you realize that they're a life that might just need to be transformed by the grace of God. The same grace that transformed your life. So you love them because you know they can be a soul that lives in eternity with God instead of damnation in hell. A love is produced in you. Paul says that as you root yourself in God, he begins to produce this life in you, this joy. You have this delight in God that goes above and beyond anything that's happening in your life and the circumstances that are taking place in your life. He'll begin to produce in you this peace, this, this restful confidence that God is always at work in your life. No matter what's happening, you have this restful confidence that his will is playing out, that he's in control, he's at work in your life. You root yourself in, in God and let put yourself in that soil, then you're going to produce patience. You begin to deal with disappointment in a different way. You don't lash out. You respond more with grace because that's how Jesus responded to us. When you root yourself in that soil, there's this kindness that begins to develop in you. Basically, it's everyone you're around, is, you're just good to them because the spirit is producing this fruit in you. There's also a goodness in you, which basically means there's integrity within you. That the more you dig into your life, the, the more somebody digs into your life, the more they see every layer that comes out. There's nothing fake. There's nothing being hidden. There's no hidden agenda. There's no secret hatred. You have integrity through and through in your life. It produces in you a faithfulness where you have this ultimate loyalty and your commitment to God is above and beyond anything else in your life. There's a gentleness that's produced in you, this meekness, this humility. You don't walk around with an entitlement that you deserve things. You walk around meek and humble. And then there's this self-control that's lived out in your life where yes, you have these other desires or you have desires that are within you, but because of what the Holy Spirit is producing in your life, you're able to say no to those desires when they're enticed to be fulfilled in the wrong way. And you have this self-control that depends only on God and his presence in your life. And what Paul says is you don't have to make a law for these things because these things are a fulfillment of the law. See, Galatians 5, 24, when he talks about being crucified with Christ, it relates to Jesus's words in John 15, 2, where he says that you must be pruned. Crucifixion and pruning, if it's being done to you, does not sound very pleasant, does it? It sounds kind of painful. 
But remember what Paul says. He says, we've got to be living what? Sacrifices. That doesn't sound pleasant either, does it? In other words, yeah, there's some pain that may go into your life. Jim Rohn had this quote. where He wrote this one time. He says, there's two types of pain in this world. There's the short-term pain of discipline. And then there's the long-term pain of regret. One weighs ounces, the other weighs tons. Choose your pain. The reformer Martin Luther said there's three things that help us to know God. One is prayer, the other is Bible study, and the other is pain, he said. The process of transformation in your life, it may be a painful process. Because when it comes to it, there there may be things that you have to give up. There's some uprooting that will have to take place in your life. There's some conversations you have to have that aren't necessarily the most fun conversations to have. James tells us that healing in our souls begins with confession. So there's conversations that won't be easy. There's disciplines that we have to commit to that may take time to form in our life and hard to develop. But it's in those moments in that process of transformation in our life where we're trying to do, as Meyer says, win within, where we've got to choose our pain. Do we want it to be a pain of discipline or do we want it to be a pain of regret? Because every point in our life, we are choosing to plant ourselves in some type of soil. We're choosing to plant ourselves in a soil that is producing what we feel like is a great life, but on the outside, it's not. Or we can choose to plant ourselves in the soil of God's grace and love and forgiveness and see it produce in us a life that is much more full and much more green and much more pleasant. The roots of our flesh will be destructive. The roots of the spirit are life. So we, I ask you this morning, Again, how dependent are you on God? Because the more dependent you become on him, the more you begin to win within. I don't want to abuse your grace, but God, I need it every day. Because your grace, your gospel, the good news of what you did for me, your love your goodness, that's what produces change in me. The more I stand in awe of God and his goodness, the more I change in him. Stand with me this morning. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful to you and to your word today. Father, I am so grateful for Jesus Christ. The life that he gave for us on the cross to bring change in our hearts and in our lives. Father, Too often we take what Jesus did for granted. And our life isn't lived to reflect the love he showed us. God, today help us to stand in awe of you and your love. Help us to grow in you, God. We don't want to abuse your grace. But Father, your grace is what we need every day of our life. So God, help us to crucify our flesh. Let us us lay ourselves down, Father, on an altar of worship before you to allow you to prune our life and work in us. As, As the psalmist said, Father, search my heart and 
everything that is in me. We give it to you today, Jesus. As we close out today in a moment of just worship, I just encourage you in this time, reflect on God's word. Seek him. If you are longing for desires in your life to be changed, it's like, a, it's like we said, it starts with what your heart most longs for and worships. Begin worshiping him. Let it start today. Worship him in a way you've never worshiped him before. If you've never given your life to Christ today, surrender to him today. In your own words, give your heart and your life to Christ and say, God, I want to follow you today. Thank you, Jesus. Help me to understand your gospel, the good news of what you did even more in my life. And let me not just say I believe it. Let me follow it. Just begin to worship him today. Reflect on his word and allow him to transform you from within. If you need prayer in any way today, we would love for you to reach out to us. You can go to our website, bwccambin.com, go to our contact page. You'll find a link there to uh, request prayer or send us anything that you uh, would like to communicate with us today. Or you can also simply text the word prayer to 803-676-7566. And we will be back in touch with you to find out how we can be in prayer for you. God bless you. We hope that you have a great week.